right. Uh, <laughs> was Andy, did you hear that introduction? Oh, I can hear that, Robin. Yep. Yeah. Oh, well, I did an introduction, but I think Lena may have switched me off. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, right, numbers have plateaued, I think. So welcome to the uh, second session of the Computational uh, Physics Challenge. And um, I hope you've got paper and pencil at the ready and are looking forward to uh, a good fast paced hour. There's an opportunity to try things out so if you download the materials, you'll find little exercises, not 10 years worth of experience of an exercise, but little exercises that you can try it for yourselves. And that's how you develop the expertise, not by thinking, can I do the whole of this thing uh, myself? Probably not yet, but in the future, maybe. So thank you very much, Dr. French. If you'd like to take it away. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the Computational Physics Challenge. OK, fantastic. So we've got 342 of you on this call. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to speak to you all. So um, this week, we are going to be reaching out to the stars and we're going to be looking at dynamic simulations of gravity. So we're going to be looking at the planets, the solar system, and how galaxies can be simulated, uh, interacting galaxies, all sorts of things, um, using uh, what we call the Verley method, which sounds fancy, but actually is constant acceleration motion. So what most of you uh, will have encountered uh, probably for several years now, but perhaps not quite in the in the sort of way that you will have met it in in, uh, in your school lessons. So um, I'm going to be talking about lots of simulations, lots of things with MATLAB, although um, the uh, recipes I'm going to be discussing will be really general uh, that you can implement in any language you like. Uh, so let's uh, let's do some sort of fundamentals first. So um, uh, this is uh, you know, one of the sort of first kind of simulations I might want to do. Uh, which is about the orbits of a, a planet you know, like the Earth ar around a star, for example, a sort of circular orbit. Um, and, but we can make life a bit more interesting uh, if we have, say, a planet and two stars, a binary system. And this particular one, this little planet here, the, the sort of the, uh, um, uh, the black, little black splodge here, is normally orbiting uh, the, the blue star here. Um, and of course, the blue star is uh, orbiting a sort of common centre of gravity, you can see. And what happens is, is that the little, little sort of black star planet is being sort of pulled by the gravitational wind, if you like, of both of these moving, orbiting uh, other planets. And so what you find is, is you find a, a perturbed orbit, which sort of uh, has this kind of spiral graph like pattern. Sometimes these are stable, sometimes these are not. And, uh, and a lot of the, the action will depend on the ratio of these masses. So um, I've got a whole load of series of simulations which are which I'll sort of describe the physics of and then kind of give you some ideas how we might create those. Okay so um, let's just have a look at some uh, some orbital dynamics first. Okay so here's here's the solar system. Um, so we've got Mars in here and there's the, the mysterious Uranus. Uh, one day we'll get a probe up close to Uranus and see what's going on. Uh, this is Neptune and uh, I think I think the Voyager 2 probe is, is the only one that really has a, a good image of that, apart from I think possibly something from James Webb uh, Telescope now. But so that's the only sort of close up we've got. And interestingly, Neptune, I think, has got some of the fastest winds in the solar system. I think we have sort of a supersonic or perhaps hypersonic winds there. Anyway, so let's um, uh, let's look at the actual dynamics of these planets. Um, so um, we're going to talk about lots of 2D, uh, but occasionally three dimensional simulations. Um, and that's actually not a bad idea because most of the planets orbit in the plane of the ecliptic. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, um, exceptions to this are obviously the comets. And in fact, Pluto, which um, is no longer, when I, was a, when I was a lad, Pluto was a planet. It's no longer a planet, it's a dwarf planet. Um, but it also has a very elliptical orbit, which is out of the plane. OK, so I've decided to put Pluto in into the simulations I will show you soon. So anyway, um, this is just sort of a, a, a picture for us. For, uh, so this is the first sort of simulation. So um, here are the orbits of the planets. So these are these are all of them plus Pluto. Um, uh, these are the inner. This is the inner solar system, and this is the outer solar system. And uh, what you can see is Pluto is really anomalous here. Um, it sort of seems to interact with the orbit of Neptune, um, and that's because that particular two-dimensional view is not really a good one for Pluto. Because you can see Pluto's orbit, it's, it's elliptical, but it's also tilted. OK, so um, in some of the simulations, we'll have to take into account a tilt from the plane of the ecliptic. 
Um, most of these orbits are relatively circular, but if you look carefully, and certainly if you look at the inner solar system, um, if you look at the orbit of, say, Mars compared to the Earth, you can see that it's, it's not quite circular. It actually follows an ellipse, and this is uh, Kepler's first law. So um, before we sort of get into the, you know, how we might code these things up, um, and uh, oh, uh, it's going to a little nod to what we're going to go. So this is this is a uh, this is perhaps uh, um, uh, sort of the last thing we'll do, uh, which is a, a planetary spirograph. So spirograph was um, a little toy that um, you know I used to play with in the 1980s, back in the mists of time, and it involved a kind of uh, two cogs, like a cog within a cog, and you put a pencil and you end up creating these wonderfully sort of spiral, spirally sort of cycloid like mathematical patterns. Well, um, you can generate these from the orbits of the planets. And so um, if we say pick Venus and Earth, the sort of what I'm highlighting now. Um, so the orbit of Earth is the blue circle and the orbit of Venus is the sort of um, kind of uh, slightly mustard colour. All right. I've tried to sort of use the colours of the planets uh, to, to a certain extent. And what you do is you, um, you, you mostly sort of you have the orbits of the, of the planets, you draw a line between them every, say, month. I think it's every month for these simulations. Um, and then what happens is you end up with this sort of uh, uh, interesting line pattern and you can see all sorts of symmetries here. So the Venus Earth spirograph uh, has this sort of five petaled uh, pattern. Uh, the Earth Mars one is slightly asymmetric because of the elliptical orbit of Mars. Mars Jupiter is really quite strange. Um, and then when you get to, uh, to Jupiter Saturn, there's a sort of three petal structure. So this is a, this is a, this is all related to the kind of um, um, period resonances that you find uh, for some of the orbits of the planets. So there are sort of extra patterns and mysteries that you can be revealed by having a representation like this. OK, so um, so we've got some uh, some basic uh, orbital patterns, um, some, some, some you know, plotting the, the trajectories of the planets. Um, and some more interesting things. And once we know those trajectories, can we do things like drawing lines between them and revealing some of the mysteries? OK, so if that's piqued your interest, good. So let's do a bit of history first. Let's uh, let's sort of build up uh, some of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Um, how do we know this stuff? Uh, and then we'll start to build some of the physical models and then I'll show you how that's coded up. OK, um, so uh, Nicholas Copernicus, all right, Johannes Kepler, Tycho Brahe, real heroes, sort of, uh, sort of post-Renaissance time. Um, prior to this, we had sort of Ptolemy's model of, uh, you know, uh, the Earth being the centre of the universe and all the planets orbiting around it. Of course, that is actually a viable model, um, uh, just that you end up with rather complicated orbits, um, if that's the case. Um, but of course, a much, much more simple understanding is to have the sun at the centre. All right. And then uh, when Isaac Newton provided a sort of coherent theory of gravity, um, you know, the sun being so much more massive than the other planets, then it makes sense for the sun to be moving very little at all compared to the planets and the orbits being ellipses about, about the sun. Uh, so an interesting bit of history uh, that Tycho Brahe, who uh, the, the great Danish astronomer whose data uh, Copernicus um, and sorry and sorry Kepler used uh, to derive his three laws. All right, so he managed to get hold of Tycho Brahe's um, interplanetary data, uh, or the orbits or orbits of the planets. Probably the best data that was um, uh, around at that time. Um, I mean, Brahe lost his nose in a duel. Uh, I'm not sure that is actually his nose, but apparently the duel was about the uh, the duel was about uh, you know the, the efficacy of a mathematical formula. So in those days, maths was dangerous. You know, I don't think any of my students have ever engaged in a in a duel to see who'd solved a quadratic equation or cubic equation correctly or not. But so there we go. Um, and I think he died horribly as well. Um, I'm not really going to get into that, but you can look it up. Uh, all I'm saying is, if you have a party and the king comes, um, make sure you go to the toilet at the right time. Right, he died in a rather nasty, uh, nasty way. But anyway, history has benefited from Tycho Brahe's demise because Johannes Kepler was able to get all of it and uh, create his three laws, of which um, uh, you know, a, a few hundred years beyond, uh, we've got um, you know almost mastery of space, uh, which is amazing. Okay, so um, all right, Kepler's three laws. What are they? So number one, uh, the orbit of every planet in the solar system is an ellipse not a circle, a squished circle with the sun at one of the foci. So here's, a, here's an ellipse, all right? This is a bit, bit more of an ellipse than any of the planets in the solar system, um, uh, even Pluto really execute. 
Um, so uh, ellipse, you know, if ellipse was a circle, the sun would be at the centre, but uh, this is one of the foci. So if you study ellipses in, in maths, there are two foci, uh, the left and the right. Uh, so you pick one of them. Uh, that happens to be where the sun is and the other planets are orbiting around that in an elliptical pattern. Uh, so um, we could define a coordinate system uh, in polars. All right, where uh, we, R is the is the range, so the actual distance of the planets from our our star, our sun, and theta is the polar angle. So if we draw a horizontal line from this, and we work out the kind of anti-clockwise uh, angle, uh, we can define um, R the range based on angle um, using uh, this polar equation. All right, so that's how we can work out sort of uh, this curve here. And we can do a bit of trigon trigonometry to work out where x and y is um, based on this. Um, uh, this is an equation called the eccentricity of the ellipse, which relates to B and A, which I've got a slightly better picture here. In fact, um, let's, um, let's, let's uh, move to the next slide to sort of see um, you know, how these are better defined. So here we go. Um, so here's a, here's a sort of um, a Cartesian grid. All right, so when we're using computer programming, uh, most plot routines, um, whether you're using matplotlib or or Python, you know, Python, anything from Python or, or MATLAB, um, uh, we need to provide an X and a Y coordinate. So, um, so here's a sort of grid, here's my ellipse, um, and there's the sort of center of, my, uh, uh, of my, my coordinate system. So R cos theta would be the X coordinate, and R sine theta would be the Y coordinate. And uh, so we can vary theta between say naught and two pi radians, maybe in a thousand steps. All right, uh, we can vary R based on that um, relationship. And then we can use r cos theta and r sine theta to find x and y. And you'll hopefully see that in, um, in several of my simulations later. So that's how we can plot an ellipse. Um, and we can define how elliptical it is by this wonderfully named equation called the eccentricity. Um, so it's uh, defined the square root of one minus b squared over a squared. And uh, b and a, they are the sort of geometry of the ellipse. So 2b, the semi-minor axis, is the sort of uh, height of the ellipse, all right, so b is a half of that, and 2a is the semi-major axis, so the long axis of the ellipse, okay. So, so there we go, so if b is equal to a, our eccentricity is zero, one minus one, uh, so that defines a circle, and if you look carefully, if, if you set epsilon equals zero into this equation, all right, r is equal to a, so there we go, that's just the radius, that's, a, <laughs> that's, a, that's an equation of the circle, the radius is a constant. OK, um, so there we are. So um, there we are. That's uh, that's a, that's a little introduction to how we might go and plot this. And that's probably the first thing you might want to try is uh, is just plot an ellipse. And if you're uh, if you've got the, uh, the technology with you, uh, you could try that immediately in Python or Excel, that kind of thing. Um, so I might, so I might throw a few sort of uh, few questions. Out there. Can we can we um, is there any way of putting a picture on the chat? Is that is that possible or is that just a, a pipe dream? Not as far as I know. Oh, well, never mind. We don't have a tech, but you, know, you have to imagine it. So if, uh, so the first challenge would be... With enough notice, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was, that was that's, that's an idea. But anyway, so uh, you're yeah, probably, yeah, 372 pictures might, might, might crash the system. But uh, yes, so the first thing you might want to try is, uh, is use this recipe to work out uh, the, um, to plot an ellipse for the orbits. All right. Um, uh, now, how does, uh, how does the period, so let's just go back to Kepler's laws. So there we go, that's, that's the first one. So um, uh, Kepler 2 is quite interesting. So it says, if, and this is what this diagram shows, that if you, so if you draw a kind of arc, so if you draw a line from your, your planet, the sun, to your uh, to the planet, let's say Venus or Earth, something like that, and um, if you pick a unit of time, let's say a month, and you shade what that arc is, so that line between the sun and the planet, what it sweeps at, that area will be the same regardless of where you are around the ellipse. So equal areas sweep out equal, um, are, are swept out in equal intervals of time. Now, I'm really intrigued how Kepler would have figured this out. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's uh, maybe Dr. Chong will better tell me uh, uh, in a conversation about this. But, you know, I, th I find this incredible how he was able to figure that out just from that data. No computers these in those times, you know, uh, sort of in pen and paper stuff. Um, but anyway, it's completely correct. Um, it sort of revolves things like angular momentum, et cetera, when you get into the analysis. Um, but uh, and this is the equation of it. So this is A is, uh, is the area. That dA by dt means the rate of, of change of air uh, of, of, of the area, and it relates to constants, the masses of the planet, the 
the star itself, the eccentricity, and A, which is this semi-major axis of the ellipse. So in other words, this is a constant. Um, and that's a really useful thing to know when you're doing calculations of orbital dynamics, if you're at that point in your, uh, in your school or uh, university career. Um, so um, I think probably my favourite of uh, Kepler's laws is the third one, um, because uh, this tells you how the period of your orbit, and it doesn't matter if it's elliptical or not, varies with the semi-major axis. So if you know the semi-major axis, you can find out how long it takes to go all the way around. And it's the square of the period goes as the cube of your semi-major axis. And what's in front of it is uh, an intriguing set of numbers involving pi uh, and the universal gravitational constant. Um, so that's a nice link to uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation. So this is how we're going to do, that's going to how we're going to make our more general uh, gravity simulations, because of course this is fine um, if you've got two bodies. But what if we have more than two? How is this all going to work? And the orbits aren't going to be elliptical. So uh, this is uh, one of Isaac Newton's many, many contributions. Um, so here we go, a mathematical theory of gravity. So I'm sure lots of you have met this before. The idea is it's an inverse square law. So we've got the product of the masses. So that's the planet, there's our star. All right, it could be two stars, could be two specks of dust, it could be you and your computer, though the force will be small. Um, there's the distance between them squared. And the constant in front, which turns that into Newtons, is this really tiny number. And uh, it's extremely difficult to actually measure this, although possible in a laboratory. Um, so uh, in fact, here we go, a little, first little quiz, who, uh, as quick as you can, which experiment uh, do we typically remember? Uh, who's the first person to have? Actually, yeah, I want the first experiment for measuring big G, um, but the probably the best known one, which was done in a shed. Um, put that into the Q&A, please, if you know the answer to this. Let's have a look. Am I seeing some, am I looking in the right place here? Ah, oh, it's just the Q&A. Are the students able to type in the Q&A, Anna? Yeah, so a few people have typed in Cavendish's experiment. We've also got some messages in the chat too. Ah, right, here we go. I'm just looking in the right wrong place. Yes, the Cavendish experiment, fantastic. Yes, so uh, Henry Cavendish did with a torsional pendulum in a big shed with some, uh, I think it was some cannonballs. Um, so um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, so you can do a version of this. I, I, I did it myself uh, with a colleague a few years ago. You have to wait until the laboratory is really, really quiet. So all the students have gone home um, and it takes all day to watch this uh, torsional pendulum rotate from one side to the other. But you can actually work out big G. And it's quite exciting to measure something about seven times 10 to the minus 11, uh, which is what we, so we did it to one significant figure. So more than one significant figure, it's quite an impressive feat. Anyway, so there we go. So that's just Newton's law of gravity. Right, so, okay, so um, these are the kind of inputs that you might wanna use uh, for the solar system. Uh, so these are the objects that we've got. Uh, these are the sort of earth masses. And this is one that you might put into an Excel sheet. Um, and uh, what we can do is that we can use Kepler's third law and then we can apply it um, for the earth with a little approximation that the mass of the sun is so much larger than the mass of uh, any of the planets. So um, if you think about, um, I've got the mass of the sun here, uh, it's about 10 to the 30. So, you know, it's, it's vast, here we are. So the sun is 333,000 earth masses, all right? Uh, Jupiter's about 300. So we can ignore the masses of the planets really easily in this. Um, so if we divide uh, the top equation here by this one, uh, we get, we got rather than in seconds, we can have the units in years and the uh, semi-major axis units in astronomical units. And nicely, we can get rid of the numbers in the front. All right. So this is a, this is a good way of doing physics problems is you sort of divide one equation by the other using the units that you know. So one year squared is four pi squared over GM sun uh, times astronomical unit cubed. That is the distance between the Earth and the Sun on average. So there we go. So Kepler's third law is perhaps easy, most easily written as the period in years 
is the um, astronomical units, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the, the semi-major axis of the orbit to the power of 1.5. So um, there we go, so that's really easy. So if you look at say Jupiter, what's its period? Well, you do 11.86, sorry, you do, <laughs> you do uh, 5.2 to the power of 1.5, which gives you 11.86 years. Uh, if you say, okay, what's the um, orbital period of Mercury? Well, you do 0 0.387 to the power of 1.5 and you get 0 0.24 years. There you go. So that's a really easy calculation to working out the periods. So if we can work out time and we can work out some um, radius, etc., we can get a really good, quite accurate model of the orbits themselves. So there we go. That's them plotted on a little graph. Um, not to scale, of course. And there we go. Um, so if you actually plot the data, <laughs> you'll get an extraordinarily good correlation of the Cactus third law. Right. So now I've got a few. Um, yeah, we are. So let's have a look. So um, there we are. Um, so if we uh, plot the, the first few planets, let's go and uh, come out of this presentation and sort of see how we might go and do that. Right. So there we go. Um, and uh, so what we're going to try and do is generate these things. So I'm going to go into MATLAB and uh, I've got a whole series of little bits of code here. So I think we'll go for the solar system first. And um, this is the uh, bit of code which says solar system orbits. So I'm loading this up. And uh, if you've never seen inside a bit of computer programming before, uh, um, I'm just going to give you a sort of a, a little tour of what's, uh, what's inside those kind of files. So every language has a slightly different way of doing it. Um, but the function bit here, basically, imagine this is a site of like a black box. What's inside that box is lots of calculations. And you can decide whether any information is exposed. So in this particular way I've done it, um, I've created a black box where, you know, no, no extra, there are no outputs to this. So I define my sort of inputs here. So I can make some animations. Um, I can put them bl the black, the background, different colors, that kind of thing. Um, and then I've got a little uh, function which will plot the, uh, the actual animation, the orbit itself. So um, I can sort of set, you know, which combination I've got um, and then the sort of colors, etc. So this is all about setting up um, what the screen will look like. Um, now, here is the uh, sort of guts of it. So um, if I just sort of highlight some key areas here. So there we go. This bit is using my polar equation of my ellipse. So I've got um, the P dot A, that, 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 that's just mean that I've, I've got, this is what we call a structured array. Um, so I've my, um, uh, my information uh, has got sort of, is in this sort of object P where A is the semi-major axis, um, ECC is the eccentricity. So it's just a way of storing information. Um, but I hope you can kind of see that we've got semi-major axis multiplied by one minus the eccentricity squared divided by one minus uh, the eccentricity times cos of the angle. All right, so I've defined my polar angle by this sort of function here. And if you've never seen anything in, in MATLAB before, I'll do that very quickly. So if we go for theta equals lin space, oops. Uh, let's go for naught to two pi and let's go in 10 steps just so you can see what's going on. All right, that will create um, a vector of 10 um, theta values between naught and two pi. All right, and if I say go for, um, let's just plot um, theta versus, let's just say, um, sine theta. All right, that is how I can actually generate a graph. There we go. So I've only got 10 steps. That looks like a really, really bad curve. All right. Um, I can make that much easier, much nicer looking rather, by say having uh, 100 steps. I've got lots more values of theta now. Um, and then if I plot that, we should get a nice smooth curve. There we go. All right. So we go for 1,000 steps. We can make that look almost as good as if you'd sketched it yourself. OK. So um, let's just sort of go back to um, my, our code here. All right, so that's how I'm generating this. In fact, if I run this little program, um, I'll put a breakpoint here and I can hover over all the different things and show you what's been created. So if we run the program, uh, it's now stopped at this point. So if I hover over P, we've got the um, mass of the, um, of, of, of the uh, so that's the mass, yeah, it's the mass of the planet. Uh, we've got the sort of, um, let's hover over that. There we go. We've got the eccentricity. Uh, beta is the orbital uh, sort of inclination. 
we've got the initial angle, the period, all sorts of things. So this is uh, this is Jupiter. Eleven point eight six is the period. Um, okay. So um, there we go. Um, and then uh, as we see, we can step through this little program, and that will sort of plot all the other bits. So um, so there we go. Um, that's how we sort of define it. Let's see if um, let's just stop that there and show you how it generates it. So there we go. I've created my axes, and if I sort of move this to one side of my screen. You should see the whole thing develop. So uh, let's just do that. So there we go. I can keep stepping in here. That's creating my lips. I've got, I'm cycling through all the different planets now. Okay, and then I've added some axes to this. I've uh, uh, changed, I've added a legend. There we go. That's that little bit. So I'm adding some labels. Uh, I've set it to be 3D because that's the option that's been set on dimensions option. And I'm going to plot the sun. Uh, there we go. Their sun's now appeared. And then I'm going to print it to a PNG file. And if the animation option's set, uh, it will do that. I don't think it has. No. There we go. And that's out. So there we go. That's a, that sort of basically how I, in, in small steps, generate um, this particular picture. There we go. So that will create this one, I think. Uh, not this one. It was that one. There we are. So um, by setting the different options, you can get all the different colors. You can make it two dimensional. Uh, you can make it three dimensional, etc. So uh, there we go. So that might be the first thing to do. And then uh, can you make an animation of, of this? So um, now I want to see if this actually works. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try this actually. Uh, let's have a look if this will give me a. This will work nicely. Uh, no, it's not. Never mind. Okay, let's um, let's do this the uh, the old way. So I should be able to have an animation here. So um, let's have a look. Um, let's just load that one up. And if we have um, just animation option here, uh, I think. Uh, yeah, actually animation, there we go, animation here, that will, that will work. And what we'll do is, let's do this one, background black. So let's see if this, let's give this a go. Oh, what have I done? I might have broken it somehow. Oh yeah, oops, animation option, there we are. Um, do, 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 do. I think that's okay, let's just try that. Oh, I've broken it. Never mind. Uh, I might have to try that another time. <laughs> anyway, never mind. Um, so uh, that, that's uh, what we can do is create an little animation of this. So ever as you step through time, see if we know the period, uh, we can work out these little positions and update them. I should be able to show you where that is in the code, um, which should be. Uh, let's just come out of that. So uh, there we go. So there we are. So this is a bit which. Um, loops through so what we're doing is we're working through going stepping through time and we're updating our, our angle so this is our initial angle uh, for initial polar angle for the planets and then what we're doing is we're saying okay um what fraction of a period have i got and that's the fraction of two pi radians we're adding to this angle and that's how we sort of uh, work it out so we're incrementing theta we're stepping through the angle theta as we plot and then once we've worked it out uh, we just update our plots using this uh, this command here. Um, so I'm not quite sure why that's not working, um, but there we go, because the breakpoint's on. Um, do, 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 do. I'll just try that just one more time. Oh, there we go, there we are, we've got it to work, hurrah. So there we are. Um, so you can see all the planets, so that's gonna be Jupiter whizzing around. So this would be in the state of the art in about, I don't know, 1978 i think um but uh, you can make this yourself uh, so you know you don't this is don't have to be belong to a kind of games game studio um there's there's, a, there's an excitement to actually creating something which animates before your eyes there we go okay so um let's uh let's get out of that so there we are so sort of task number one would be to sort of create animations of planets where we know what the orbit is at any given time now so uh, we can then use that information to create our spirographs. 
Um, so uh, here we are. So this is these are slightly larger ones. So basically, we work at um, um, you know a time interval. I think I think I've used a month or something like this. Um, um, there we go. I think what did I say? Delta T is n times the maximum orbital parameter uh, divided by one, two, three, four, something like this. <laughs> you know, you can choose, and uh, you will create this little spirograph. So um, I don't know if I'm. I think that's probably uh, yeah. So if we've if we've got the Earth coming around, if you look really carefully, you sort of peer in. You'll see like little sort of spheres around this. So that's the you know a little sort of circle which is plot the, the the location of the Earth at any given time. And then we've got the location of um, Venus at any given time. And we're drawing a line between them. Um, and then over a good number of orbits, uh, we create this sort of spirograph structure. I was inspired by uh, this website. And if I can load this one up. There we go. So it kind of sort of shows you um, how it's all working. So this is Earth versus Mercury. And you can see the line drawn between it. All right. And uh, so Mercury is going around the sun. The Earth's going around the sun. Um, but we end up creating this rather beautiful pattern. And there we go. I think we can select different planets. So this one has, uh, has Venus. There we go. There we are. So um, it's a rather sort of beautiful, beautiful thing to do. Um, and to create this, all you need to have is a, a pattern of the orbits versus time. Um, the tricky bit is to sort of, you know, have the same time for both. So you have to sort of interpolate your angle versus time vector in order to do this. Um, but there we go. So um, that's how you produce all these rather beautiful patterns. Okay, uh, so there's Mercury Earth. That sort of looks like some sort of virus that you might see under a microscope. Um, uh, Venus Mars is very interesting. Um, anyway, so here's the question. <clears throat> so we've had sort of two planets where we can, you know, use Kepler's laws to work exactly what's going to happen next. But what happens? Um, well, do we have to do that for a start? And then secondly, if we have lots of planets that interact via gravity, how can we determine what happens next? You know, how do we solve that? Unfortunately, we can't solve the three body problem. <clears throat> so, you know, we can work out the trajectories of you know, elliptical orbits if we have a star and a planet or two, two planets something or two stars. But if we have three of them, we can't actually write down the equation for what's going to happen next. It's not possible as far as we know. Um, so that's rubbish. You know, how, how do we how do we simulate all this, all these things? Um, so um, this is how we do it or one way of doing it. So we're going to use good old a uh, uniform uh, uh, sort of a, a, a uniform acceleration motion. So what we do is we need to know uh, the initial positions. So R, anything that's bold here means a vector. All right. So we could have lots of different planets and objects. Uh, v is the vector of all their velocities. OK. And T is time. And so we can have a force law, which will be Newton's law of gravity. All right. To work out the acceleration from mass times acceleration as vector sum of force um, for all of these objects. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a very small but fixed time step. So at any given point, we know what the accelerations are. So we're going to evolve time and then we're going to use constant acceleration motion, but between the time steps. OK, so um, so ut plus a half at squared, that kind of thing. So but these are vectors. All right. Um, and so uh, what we'll do is we'll, in, a, in our time step, we'll figure out what's going to happen next. And then um, there's a slight wrinkle for this because um, sometimes your force law might depend on velocity. So, um, you know, to update the velocity, we kind of, you know, might need to know what that velocity is. That would be a circular reference. So what we can do is we can approximate this by saying that, um, you know, V is uh, the original velocity plus AT. All right, so we know what that acceleration, we can update this and then we can run our acceleration calculator again and then have an average of those and that will update our velocity. So, in fact, actually, for gravity, we don't need to worry about this because there is no dependence on velocity for gravity. But you could think of other laws like air resistance where that is true. Anyway, so that's the, basically are the, the engine for working out what happens next. All right. So. Uh, 
let's go and uh, let's go and apply this to an interesting system. So um, uh, there's a bit of maths here, so I want to sort of just sort of highlight. But let's we'll do the simulation shortly. So what I've got is I've got two stars here. Uh, the blue one that has that sort of uh, orbit here and the red one which has this little orbit and the poor little sort of uh, a black planet this one here <laughs> so that's r3 right, that's the third object ends up making this sort of really chaotic orbit uh, based on these two things so my so my um the ma mass of this planet is very small and uh, we've got uh, three solar masses and two solar masses for these ones right a bit of explanation of what this is so this is newton's second law all right, uh, what that means, so I've got minus gm over r squared. How have I implemented this? So if you imagine I've got two masses here, the r we're talking about is uh, this distance between them. So in a coordinate system, I might know the position of this one, and I might know the position of this one here. So to find that distance between them, I can do this vector, all right, the vector r, which is rm minus this one, or minus that one plus this one here. So um, what I want to do is find out the direction of my acceleration. And, it, and a nice way of doing this is actually to multiply this by that vector uh, distance. So Ri minus Rj is the vector displacement between the two stars. And I'm gonna divide that by the cube of its um, magnitude. Why a cube not squared? Well, you think about it. Um, I've got, uh, I, I'm actually got this sort of, uh, you know, I need to sort of divide by its magnitude to get its direction here. So then I end up with an extra power of, of the magnitude of this thing. So this coupled with this, all right, suitably coded up, allows you to make yourself a gravity simulator. So let's, uh, let's next for five minutes, let's have a little tour of a few of these. So um, let's go and bring some of these up. Right, so uh, let's find out, so let's do something a bit more a bit different. So let's go for this one uh let's go for i think it was binary star and planet that one let's see if this works i think this is what i must just mentioned there we go let's just make that a little bit smaller all right so hopefully you can now see that animating so what it's done is it's computed the orbits and then it's animating uh the orbits of the blue star and the yellow star and the red star sorry um, and the trajectory of my planet is this sort of black line which it's following. Um, it will eventually, if we left this running for several minutes, would follow the sort of green path. OK, so you can see this is not an elliptical orbit. So if we have a quick look in this in this code. Um, so just a couple of things to point out. I've got all my inputs here and the green stuff is commentary. So when you're writing code, the best thing to do, particularly if you've never done this before, is you write down uh, what the stuff is going to what, what's going to do, what are these things, and then you can try and look up um, what the syntax for it is. So a computer doesn't actually read uh, the commentary. Uh, that's for your benefit. So I always start the commentary and then I write the code. So these are all the inputs. Uh, these are my initial conditions, and you might spot Kepler's third law here. Um, and then this is how we work out the initial speeds based on what Kepler's second law really. And then I have a function which works out the accelerations due to gravity. Um, and then I work out what happens next using my Verlet method. So I've got several um, different objects here, x1 and x and y1, etc. But hopefully you can, if you just look at one of these, you'll see it's v t v delta t plus a half a delta t squared. All right. So although it's in a kind of computer syntax, it has exactly the same mathematical form that we saw before. And all I'm really doing is repeating this, <coughs> excuse me, for different objects. OK, so um, that's that one. Um, let's have a look. So we've got um, uh, this is quite a fun one. So we can look at um, rather than having uh, just one object, we might have several. So here we've got uh, some rings of masses. And uh, these are executing circular orbits about their uh, companion stars. So the, the, this is the magenta cloud orbiting the, this one here. And we've got the green cloud orbiting this one. Um, but unfortunately, uh, they can, well, they can also, also feel the gravity of the opposing star. So these stars, you know, orbit each other. Um, and the, uh, the green ones, they don't really have any mass, so they don't interact with each other. 
but they are they feel the gravity of the two stars <coughs> so quite rapidly you can see something which um is quite interesting and we get these sort of tails that form and i think this looks pretty close to what you see um, if you were to sort of look out with the James Webb telescope or the Hubble Space Telescope, these sort of tidal tails. That's not for, you know, a sort of nebulae, but for galaxies. You know, we see these spiral galaxies. So it's perhaps a bit of a conceit to think how they might form from perfectly circular orbital patterns, but that gravity then itself will sculpt these rather beautiful uh, um, sort of tidal patterns. Um, so tidal forces are where the force of gravity varies sort of over, say, a planet so, uh, or perhaps even a solar system. Um, and uh, that's just happened in the last last minute or so with this simulation. This is running live. Um, OK, so there we go. Um, so I just going to nip back to the presentation. Uh, do we have any questions in the Q&A before I, I proceed a bit further? Uh, do, 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 do. Um, maybe they asked in the simulation, are the orbits of the stars computed before that of the planet? Oh, right. OK, so for um, for the interacting galaxies one. Um, so no, what I'm doing is uh, oh, actually that, that's a very good question. I think uh, I think I'm using a sort let's just look at the solver actually, so let's not make it up. Um, so it's for this one was. Uh, do, 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 do. Actually, it depends. I think I've got two variants of this. So uh, not this one, interacting galaxies. There we go. So if we have a look at this, um, let's have a look at the gravity function I'm using. Uh, yes, so I'm using the Verley method for this. So I'm not saying exactly how it's going to work. Yeah, so basically all of this, uh, there's nothing in here I'm using sort of Kepler's laws. I mean, as it turns out, uh, let's just run that one again. As it turns out, um, you know, the, uh, the orbits are very, very elliptical uh, of these things. That happens naturally. Um, but I've not actually had to code that in at all. The only thing I've had to tell it are one of the, the, net, the, the initial conditions such that we have circular orbits to start off with. So you do have to sort of use Kepler's laws for that. Um, you know, you can work out the velocity quite easily for that. You know, sort of two pi divided by the, um, uh, you know, the, the two pi times the radius over the period, and then use Kepler's laws to work out some um, initial velocities. And I've done that, um, if I just start the simulation again, I've done that to set things up so we have initially circular orbits. Um, you can do things randomly. Uh, so I've got, I think, this one, which is the random one, random stars. Uh, is that one? Actually, it's the other one I want. I think it's this one. Yeah. So this one here. There we go. I've got a whole bunch of random stars which are orbiting each other. <laughs> um, and you can see there's all sorts of strange things going on here. Um, I've got, uh, uh, I think it's one of the orbits ones, if I run this. Yeah, this is quite good. So you can kind of uh, have a sort of central star and some randomly moving planets. Um, and all of these are interacting under gravity. So it seems films like a kind of swarm. And there we go. So if, you, if your eye follows one of them, uh, all of this is done by the Verley method. Um, and, uh, and perhaps here's an interesting one, which is I'm calling star to white dwarf. So here we go. Let me just put this on the screen. So what we've got is we've got lots of mutually circular orbits here. <clears throat> and I've got this sort of uh, planet, which is uh, executing a circular orbit too. So everything's going around in a circle. And once we get to one circular orbit, something bad happens to this star. It loses some of its mass. So the uh, strength of gravity now changes and my planet now X starts to execute a, an elliptical orbit. And what you find is, is that the sort of uh, these little planetlets, which were, um, you know, don't have any mass themselves, um, are still bound by gravity. All right. But they are now executing rather different orbits. So there we go. So whether that really models what happens when a, <laughs> a star sheds its uh, its sort of um, you know outer uh, outer envelope and leaves it so it's out to be a white dwarf, I'm not sure. But uh, but there we go. You can kind of play with these dynamic things. That's a good problem, by the way, to work out what happens, uh, what type of elliptical orbit 
uh, you get when you lose mass. Uh, it's in Rees's book, uh, Physics by Example. Um, so those of you who study physics at university, that's a cracking problem that you'll be probably set in your first year. Okay, uh, so uh, there we go. Um, the sort of the code we're talking about here, the gravity engine, if you like, um, is, is this one. So however you do it, you know, most of the code that I'm writing is all about, okay, I've got these ranges, these velocities, these accelerations, these times, let's update a picture, okay? Um, most of the code is all about that. Uh, what happens next is just an implementation of this, okay? Which, um, you know, you can do efficiently with using vectors, something like NumPy in Python. Um, every language will have a slightly different one or lists in Python. Um, but really, you know, that is it. That is the mathematical recipe for all of this. Okay, uh, so there we are. So um, that's um, that's 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 sort of a particularly pretty simulation. Oops, and this is like the uh, what we've just seen with our sort of contracting star. So there we go. After one ro rotation, or I think it's n, I think it's one, <laughs> it loses quite a lot of its mass. Uh, okay, so um, here we are. We've looked at the interacting galaxies. Um, and uh, uh, there we are, we've got our spontaneous formation of these tidal tails. This is a really good thing. I actually wrote a simulation on this in Excel uh, at university. It's nowhere near as good and as pretty as doing things with a computer programming language, but can be done. Um, and there we are. So if you do several screenshots, you end up with some rather beautiful things. So the ratio here, we've got some uh, five solar masses is M1 and three solar masses is M2. Uh, so looking at this, I'm guessing it's probably the, uh, the, the, the more compact one, which is, which is M1, that's the green one there. Um, so you might actually sort of see these kind of forms. So that's the Messier 83 galaxy. So you see all these sort of spiral arms. <clears throat> so how do they form? Well, uh, they form as a natural consequence of gravity. Uh, circular orbiting, um, you know, clouds of dust, uh, which uh, are pulled by more than one object you know, mutually orbiting stars in a binary system, something like that. Obviously a galaxy, we're talking about billions of stars, but you know, you might think about the sort of center of your galaxy being really large, you know, a kind of black hole, supermassive black hole, and perhaps the formation of your spiral arms by interaction with other galaxies, all right? So hence, this is not really a simulation of planets, but a simulation of galaxies interacting. Okay, so that's uh, that'd be a really good project, you know, if you got to grips with some of these things. Um, so um, yeah, here's a <coughs> here's a sort of Verlet simulator with um, you know uh, 52 masses. So um, it does scale up. <coughs> it can be a bit more inefficient um, if you do things in a sort of loop. So you have to think about the programming uh, to have more multiple objects. But um, you know the force laws work. If you look at the sort of blue trajectory here, all sorts of uh, madness happens as you have multiple masses interacting. Um, and uh, here's a sort of random star one. So uh, this, is, this is sort of a gravitational chaos here. Um, I think it's probably very unlikely you'd see this in, in nature because the distances between the planets and stars are so vast. Um, but um, so, you know, pairs of orbiting planets and stars seem to be more likely, but threes, fours, fives, almost certainly unstable. So there we go. Um, however, <laughs> That said, um, that's not quite true. So um, Sagittarius A star, um, not just uh, didn't just pass this exams. It's uh, this is the black hole in the centre of the Milky Way. Uh, so um, and uh, you know that's been imaged uh, directly uh, recently. Um, but before that, um, you know, it was postulated by looking at the orbits of lots of other stars very close to it. You can't see Sagittarius A star. We're not, 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 uh, not directly. It's a black hole. Um, but there's all these different orbits. All right. So these quite, uh, but nonetheless, elliptical orbits. So the interactions between the different stars here, um, Sedna, Eris, Pluto, and Neptune. I think. Uh, do, do, do. Oh no, sorry, that's the same scale. My apologies. So these are the. So that's uh, these are much bigger orbits than ones for our, our solar system, you know, that, that one that's in the corner. Uh, they're not really interacting with each other. Um, so the, the dominant player here is this sort of uh, massive object at the center. Um, so you have all these different mutual, mutually elliptical orbits. Uh, and from that, you can work out the mass of this object at the center, uh, which drives it all. Uh, it's about 
million solar masses. Okay, right, uh, there we are. I think that's another representation of, of that um, system. So there we go. Uh, so hopefully a little, a little sort of tour of what can be done uh, with, uh, uh, with sort of a gravity code. Um, uh, so in summary, uh, what do we do? Um, so we started off with uh, looking at some simple simulations such as this. So the first thing you might want to do <clears throat> is use Kepler's laws and plot them. All right, you know exactly what the ellipse is going to look like. Um, so we had that kind of um, that formula sheet here for doing that. Uh, you then might want to animate those things. Uh, there we are. There is our sort of animation. All right. So if we know where the positions are versus time, you can update that uh, that plot and make yourself an animation. That'd be an excellent thing to do. Uh, once we know that information, we can do something crazy like uh, draw lines between them and make these sort of spirographs. Um, and then if you're feeling particularly brave um, and you're, you're used to you know, coding things up, we might want to use uh, the Verley method, constant acceleration motion, uh, to work out what happens next from multiple bodies. Although my top tip was, would be to start things off the initial conditions such that there are mutually circular orbits. So, for example, this one might be a, in a circular orbit about the red star uh, initially, uh, while the red star and the blue star are on the mutually circular orbits, and then uh, see what happens next. OK, uh, are there any more questions? Does the Verley method account for masses of other planets or is it just the main star? Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So, um, well, this is completely general. Um, so we are the MJ there, that is the mass of the sort of source of the gravitational field. Um, so there could be lots of them. <clears throat> so if we look at, say, um, you know, we've got a, one of these little, that little black mass there. Um, we are looking at um, the force of gravity due to the mass of this one, the red star, and the force of gravity due to the blue star. So the MJ would be three solar masses for one of them or two solar masses for the other. Um, and you could uh, do that for any number you like. Um, but to create the inter interacting galaxy simulation, so this one, um, because I'm running it on a, on a standard PC, these little tiny masses here, the green ones and the, and the magenta ones, only feel the masses of the blue one and the red one. OK, so there's no interaction between them. But if you do this on a supercomputer, that might be able to cope with the interactions between each of those together. So you can get a much more realistic uh, simulation, but that would be so slow, you know, we would better do that on a PC very easily. Uh, <clears throat> why aren't there algebraic ways of expressing systems of three phases? <laughs> if you can solve that, you'll win the, the maths uh, prize, uh, uh, but uh, uh, good luck with that one. <laughs> Nobody's found a way of doing it yet. Uh, right, can you explain the Verley acceleration equations more? I will try my best. So um, all I can suggest, so this, here we are, that's, that's the largest version. If you know that the displacement, if you can kind of, uh, I know, um, have an accelerating car with an initial velocity, ut plus a half a t squared is the displacement. I use the initial velocity, a is the acceleration, t is the time. And v is u plus a t, so that's a constant acceleration motion. So if you look at your equations of kinematics, these are the same. The only difference is we're talking about a time step, all right, and the, uh, things in front of bold. So these are actually vectors which correspond to any number of objects we've got. So in the case of our simulation here, we've got three objects, the black one, the uh, uh, red one, and the blue one. Okay, but otherwise it's the same. And the only difference is, is our acceleration will vary between uh, as our time step uh, elapses because once we've updated all the positions, our force law, which is given by this expression, Newton's second law, will change because the positions of all the masses will vary um, as time progresses. So that's why we have to do this in a loop. And that's what the end means. Uh, okay, uh, what have we got? How would you go about including many particles in a simulation such as with galaxy examples? So um, essentially, um, I mean, this is a programming kind of idea, but you create a vector with as many objects as possible. Um, so some of the vectors in my simulation might have thousands of objects. OK, um, but essentially we're still using it. And in Python, you'd, you'd loop over a list of all your different objects that you've created. Um, OK, uh, do do do. Oh, lots of questions here. 
uh, gravitational waves. Well, um, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 I suppose you can kind of see these kind of ripples, but for gravitational waves, that's that requires you know some idea of radiation. Uh, so uh, that's that's that we're not really going to see that behaviour so much. But you might see things like shock fronts, um, some of the sort of fluid dynamic behaviour you can see. Um, you can get some of it by cheating, by modifying that law and having some repulsion when things get close. Because if you get into this, what you'll find is when things get really close to each other, that uh, the, the the difference between the positions can get a bit a bit large. Sorry, a bit small rather. So the difference becomes uh, close to zero, and that means your acceleration between time steps could be enormous. So that can um, cause lots of artifacts in your simulation. So what a lot of people do is either just ignore that, um, or they have some sort of repulsive force, uh, which isn't really you know, realistic. You know, gra gravity is always attractive. So uh, do other bodies in the universe affect the rotations of other bodies? Uh, well, yes. <laughs> so uh, everything interacts via gravity. And as far as we're aware, um, uh, you know, well, we're not really sure what dark matter and dark energy mean um, at the moment. I think that's fair to say. But um, the gravitational attraction can sculpt these tidal forms. So what we've seen here, you don't need any other force. Obviously, electromagnetism is going to be working you know, um, when you're right, really close in, you know, in the sort of formation of stars, etc. But on a grander scale, it's gravity. Uh, would, how possible would it be to do this kind of simulation on a GPU? Well, um, I must say, I, maybe I, I've never used CUDA, um, but uh, you could, yeah, you could make this much faster, um, you know, by um, sort of uh, giving it lots of different processes, etc. So yeah, you, you could make this uh, much faster than I've, I've done. Please do this. How can you create animations and graphs? Um, right, so um, I think, uh, so what I, I did sort of talk about that a bit earlier, that you run the simulation in the loop and then you update your positions, um, you know, uh, for every iteration, but you have to sort of create your scene first and then you update the X and Y positions as you go. Uh, so you need to sort of look at your favorite language, how that works. Um, On a practical level, Whatever language you're using, there will be a live read up that will do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so the, the best key, thing to do is you words are just to look up the word animation and it will do it for you. Yeah. And I like it. If, you, so if you're starting out with this, the best thing to do is sort of, well, you can download all my code from, uh, from here. Uh, so I think we've put, we've put that in the chat. Um, so the little MATLAB icon should give you everything that we've been talking about today. And you, if you, want to put that into python you can recode it um but the best thing to do is to sort of uh, look up what people have done before you know just type things into google or w3 schools there's you know there's so many different websites and just get someone else's source code and uh and have a go and rewrite some of it pack around with it um you know so uh, there's so much out there um that, you know you don't need to sort of start to uh, start from from scratch um do we have any other questions I think we've got to nine o'clock, so we probably ought to stop now. Uh, maybe one more. Uh, lots. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, all right. How do you know if the S is from Jack? Hello. How, if you, how do you know if the angle of inclination beta is from the x axis or the y axis? Ah, right. Cracking question. So, um, in the simulation I showed, I think we'll just do, we'll just look at that one. That's a, that's a really good question. Uh, let's have a look. So this would be in, let's go and find it. I think it was this one. Uh, there, right. Okay, so it's really only Pluto that we're interested in. And the idea is that the beta angle, I've just sort of defined as the angle from the plane of the ecliptic. So all we have to do is you have to sort of rotate. I've done, I've, I've rotated the, uh, the X and the Z coordinates, and I've kept the Y coordinates the same. So you have to sort of decide, decide you know, how you're going to do it. Um, so, um, so you can sort of see here, I've, 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 I've tilted uh, the X, Z plane, and I've kept the, the Y plane the same. Um, I, mean, I suppose in principle, you could have a rotation in any direction. There's no real reason why it should be like that. Um, but there we go. Uh, so that, that's what I've defined in this model. I think in, in reality, you probably have more than one uh, inclination parameter. I think NASA release uh, all the, the, you know, the ellipse in, in three dimensions uh, for all the orbits. Um, okay, I think that's 
probably it. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope that's uh, you know giving you some ideas really. As Robin said earlier, um, you know this isn't this isn't sort of a, a lecture where you know that's it. We're done. We, we do an exam. This is sort of hopefully giving you some inspiration to try some things for yourself. You know, if you're starting out, just see if you can plot some elliptical orbits. Um, you know, using the data, that'd be that'd be fantastic. Whereas if you're you know done a lot of this stuff before, can you make an animation or can you try a n body gravity simulator? Uh, it is possible. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we'll be back, if not next week, but in two weeks' time. Um, are you sure when we're back? Sorry, we better be clear about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, no, we're not. We're, aren't we back next week? Yeah, um, we're back next week. Yeah, there is a half term next week. Um, I can be back next week. Um, so tell you what, shall we? Uh, can you watch this ah. space if you're still here? And okay. uh, we'll, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll let you know. It will be, yeah. It'll be on the BPHO website and we'll email you. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for attending. <laughs> there are a few miscellaneous questions. Can time, time dilation be negative? No, it can't. <laughs> yeah, I just answered that one. Yeah. Uh, half term, yes. So um, a lot of schools have different half term dates. So that's why we're sort of thinking about that. <laughs> um, how does the Verlier method apply in this simulation? Isn't acceleration changing constantly? Well, you're assuming that for the small time step, the acceleration is sufficiently constant that you can yeah. use this as an approximation. Yeah. But yes, in general, it, it, it will change. Yeah, because that's the point, is that the acceleration is changing. But as uh, Dr. Chung said, um, we can assume in a certain, a certain so it should be small elements of time, we can ignore that variation. Yeah. Um, and then do you want to answer the last one, Dr. French? OK, how do you then plot positions from the Burley method? What values does it uh, does it using? So, OK, so um, if I if I if I if I still here, so if I bring up um, here we go. So this is basically saying, OK, uh, it's R is my um, is my position vector, all right? So um, R1 and R2 or three are, are these particular objects. So as we, as we evolve time, that position vector will update. So the output of our Verley method is what happens next? So if I'm here uh, in my next time step, where does it go next? It kind of goes down here somewhere. <laughs> this one will go a bit further around. So I can, um, so my Verley method basically tells me after delta T seconds, what will my new position vector be? what will my new velocity vector be? And then I just run that in a loop. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, for, thank you everyone for attending. Um, so we are going to close the session down. Um, and panelists, if we just debrief, that would be wonderful. We can't actually remove participants anymore because then they can't rejoin. So unless everybody leaves of their own accord, we'll just have to end the session. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's very nice to see you, but yes, I think. Uh... <laughs> I am going to end the session, but I can send another Zoom link if you wish. No, no, it's it's, it's uh, well, we do need to discuss. The thing we need to discuss is are we going next week or the week after, etc. That's actually fairly important for us to discuss. Uh, and and it'd be quite nice to have a list of topics. Uh, I mean, whatever order, so we can put it up. At the moment we okay, I'm just going to end this because everybody. Thinks okay, and, um, who's resending the link?